question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And as is customary with uh, meetings uh, hosted by Religions for Peace, perhaps we can begin with that moment of silence. Thank you. It gives me distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to uh, the Baha'i International Community's UN office. I see Ms. Enderitu has just entered uh, our office, so perhaps I'll just pause and allow her to walk in. <laughs> Maybe we should have started earlier. <laughs> but um, we uh, are gathered here for this uh, side event uh, during the 2023 Counterterrorism Week at the United Nations. And the side event is on, on, on a whole of society approach, religious actors as drivers of change and preventing violent extremism. My name is Bani Dugal and I represent the Baha'i International Community. And uh, very happy to be joined here with uh, your excellency and friends, uh, religious leaders and experts in this area. The United uh, Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, when launching the UN strategy and <clears throat> platform for action on hate speech said, hate speech is a menace to democratic values, social stability and peace. And as a matter of principle, the UN must confront hate speech at every turn. Silence can signal indifference to bigotry and intolerance, even as a situation escalates and the vulnerable become victims. So hate speech is not the only cause, but a very important trigger for violent extremism. Um, and I think religion and religious actors have a tremendous power to unite and can also take the, while they also unite, they could also uh, at times be dividing and disunifying. So every religious leader really has to make a conscious choice as to what kind of protagonist she or he is. Um, I was recently uh, representing Religions for Peace at uh, a, a meeting of the Interparliamentary Union in Marrakesh. And Dr. Abadi, uh, the head of, or the representative of the Mohammedia, and also a close friend of Catherine Marshall and others, uh, said, and it really struck me, he said, parliamentarians are the interpreters of the heartbeats of the people. And in that vein, I would say that if they are the interpreters of the heartbeats, I think it's religious leaders that motivate the heartbeats to beat to the highest aspiration of uh, human beings. So I think religious leaders have a tremendous power and uh, both the Rabat and Fez processes have outlined some actions religious leaders can take but perhaps we will hear some really good examples in our discussion today. And I'm looking forward to hearing those and contributing during the conversation we have. I now um, introduce uh, Her Excellency um, Under Secretary General, Alice Inderitu, who is the Special Advisor to the UN Secretary General on Genocide Prevention and Atrocity Crimes. Ms. Inderitu. Thank you very much. And first, I apologize for coming in late. Um, I just came from another meeting um, because this year is the 75th anniversary of the 1948 Convention on the, on the uh, Punishment and uh, of the, of the 1948 Convention uh, for the Crime and Punishment, so for the Punishment and Crime of Genocide. And, uh, so we have so many, so much that's going on around preparing for this big day, uh, the 75th anniversary of this convention. Uh, most people don't 
um, know or don't remember that actually the very first convention that the, the United Nations agreed to that was adopted by the United Nations was that 1948 convention for the hardship of climate genocide. And um, it was uh, adopted on the 9th of December 1948, followed on December 10th by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So sorry, we were in all those arrangements. And um, so I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this side event of the 2023 Council of Terrorism on the role of religious actors in preventing violent extremism and acting as drivers of change. And I thank the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism and the, especially my good friend, Under Secretary General Vladimir Boronkov, uh, uh, for providing this important platform because it allows us to think collectively on solutions to counterterrorism and violent extremism that in some circumstances can contribute to the perpetration of atrocity crimes, religion, and genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. So I also thank the co organizers of this side event. And um, I, I, pardon me if I don't name every, everyone, but uh, the Network for Religious and Traditional Peacemakers and its executive director, also my good friend, Dr. Mohamed El Tabusi, Religions for Peace, and the Secretary General, my sister and friend, Professor Azakara. Action of Churches Together, Act Alliance, and its General Secretary, Rodel Mabueno Ifaria, another good friend. Uh, the World Council of Churches and its program executive, uh, Reverend Dr. Ibrahim Yusuf Bushishi, who we've planned to do quite a number of things. And our gracious host, the Baha'i International uh, Community, Ms. Bani Dugal, Principal Representative of Baha'i International Community to the UN. Um, and all these are people who are familiar to us because they sit on the technical team that drafted the plan of action for religious leaders and actors uh, on the prevention of incitement and violence that could lead to atrocity crimes that was launched by the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, five years ago. And last year, on the fifth anniversary, all of us met together in Face Morocco, where it all began to talk about what we've been able to achieve so far. So we do know the conditions conducive to the spread of terrorism and violent extremism are often intertwined with the root causes of atrocity crimes, which are described as genocide war crimes and crimes against humanity. And prevention of these crimes is of paramount importance to spare people from suffering violence and death. We've seen violent extremism lead to atrocity crimes. For example, um, places where I've spent a lot of time, Iraq and Syria, uh, with the violations and abuses committed by the so-called Islamic State, in particular against religious communities. And yesterday, I put out a statement welcoming that we now have a third person uh, who's been convicted for, for genocide against the Yazid community, uh, one of the members of uh, ISIL. So the threats posed by ISIL is not limited to the Middle East as its geographical spread has increased across the African continent, where its affiliates and other terrorist groups exploit local conflicts and state fragilities to advance their agenda. The suffering inflicted on people is indescribable and the traumas are open and relieved daily as people feel afraid and vulnerable. And I say so from a very practical perspective because before I came to the UN, that's why I was, I was working among those community and living in those communities. So we have also witnessed with this way, terrorists and violent extremist attacks committed in places considered safe from this court. As was the case of the attacks against people in two mosques during a Friday uh, prayer in Christ Church in New Zealand back in 2019. Uh, an attack that reminded the whole world that no peace is free from racism, xenophobia, intolerance, discrimination that fails to try and that indeed risk factors of violent extremism and atrocity crimes are present in every nation across the globe. So we do know that there's a lot that can be done to prevent violent extremism and advance atrocity crimes prevention. And that much that needs to be done is especially in a support partnership. So certainly prevention um, work relies greatly on the activities of various stakeholders and their collaboration. And so today I'm focusing on the role of religious leaders and actors. And I use the word actors to acknowledge that not all religious actors are leaders. Mm -hmm. Yet they can still be very influential within their communities. For instance, women and youth and religious leaders and actors exert great influence among those who share their beliefs. They shape the behaviors of their followers and engage members of their communities in important reflections. However, this influence is not always positive. Religion can unite people on messages of peace, inclusion, and acceptance, advancing connection, trust, respect, and inclusion, as we know. 
but it can also be instrumentalized to foment segregation and exclusion of divisiveness, including by using interpretation of religious scriptures. So for this reason, religious leaders and actors stand as vital partners in countering the instrumentalization of religious beliefs for violent purposes and in promoting and advancing human rights norms. And the 2030 agenda um, and the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. So these are the key messages of the plan of action for religious leaders and actors to prevent systemic violence that will lead to atrocity crimes that I just mentioned. And we also call it the first plan of action because it was first, uh, it began the drafting in phase. And so this plan of action um, is a result of two years of consultations that began in phase Morocco, um, led by these leaders you see here um, from different faiths and religions around the world. And my, by my predecessor, Adam Adien, and it consists of a set of options and tools for action that religious leaders and actors can take to prevent and counter incitement to violence in situations at risk of atrocity crimes, including by engaging in dialogue with those who express religious views, countering hate speech online and offline, as well as supporting interreligious and intercultural dialogue, education and activities that uphold human rights and fundamental freedoms and promote cultural diversity and the values of moderation and, and acceptance. So last year, I took over about um, two and a half years now um, from my predecessor. And so I, I led the UN team to commemorate the fifth anniversary of this first plan of action. And I've mentioned that we all went to face Morocco to take stock of the implementation of, of this plan. So um, I would like to emphasize that the UN considers engaging with religious leaders and actors as a priority towards advancing implementation of the three pillars of the organization, namely peace and security, Human rights and sustainable development. And we know that former Secretary General Ban Ki moon established in 2010 the UN Agency Task Force on Religion and Sustainable Development. And this is a very active IATF up to today. Um, and it's a platform uh, that we engage on a regular basis for knowledge exchange, capacity building, system wide guidance, and oversight regarding engagement with faith based inspired civil society actors. And my office at the moment currently chairs this IATF, the Interagency Task Force on Religion, jointly with UNFPA um, and the Alliance of uh, Civilizations. In 2018, this IATF established a multi faith advisory council composed of faith based partners to inform the UN work through a multi faith approach. And this now consists of more than 40 entities, many of which are implementing the first plan of action. So the latest retreat of the Multi-Faith Advisory Council took place last May at the United Nations headquarters in New York, at the heart of the contract system, which demonstrates the value of the multi-faith and inclusive approach in our work. So today, friends, we are in an event that provides an opportunity to reflect on ways we can strengthen our engagement with religious leaders, actors, and faith-based organizations to advance the values and principles on which the United Nations was founded and to link this reflection to many other ongoing processes. So for instance, just this week on 19th July, um, on Monday, we celebrated the second International Day of Country Speech, which was established by General Assembly Resolution 75309. And uh, we celebrated it with a huge event that was organized um, by my office in partnership with collaboration with the Kingdom of, of Morocco and the President of the General Assembly. And so this event offered an opportunity to renew the UN commitment to tackling hate speech as a way to counter hatred and prevent violence, including violent extremism, conflicts, and atrocity crimes. So we've showcased initiatives led by our colleagues in the field since the adoption of the UN strategy and black battle of hate speech, for which implementation my office is a global focal point, United Nations focal point. And so we focus in particular on the power that each individual has in contributing to respectful interactions with them. And on the occasion of the International Day for Country Hate Speech, we've also launched a 60 day campaign to engage in dialogue on country hate speech in full respect of fundamental rights, including the freedom uh, of expression. So there are quite a number of activities that are happening, and much um, has to do with especially linking hate speech to hate crime and then hate crime to atrocity crimes. So I mentioned earlier that I've just come from an event um, to 
arrange for what we are going to do around uh, the 75th anniversary of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. We shall be writing to you, our as partners, in terms of what vision we have for this day. And um, we are focusing on the legacy uh, of, of this day. Uh, much of um, the, 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 especially the academic um, writing in the in the first part of um, after 1948, maybe 30, 40 years after 1948, um, has been focused on um, what the convention did not achieve. That genocide happened even uh, as a convention existed. The genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda happened yet we had a convention on genocide. Uh, the genocide in Srebrenica happened yet we had this convention. But after uh, the two genocides happened, there were huge efforts in terms of uh, especially um, instrumentalizing, in terms of ensuring that, that the, the convention was, was a fact and, and the food to drink use. So we have quite a number of legal perspectives of unpacking uh, the, the, the convention. We have um, many judgments, like I just mentioned, there was a verdict yesterday from a court in Germany um, that put away um, this uh, ISIL um, as of for uh, the crime of genocide. So, and we've had many, many more. Rwanda actually provided us that first conviction. Convi uh, conviction. Um, mm -hmm. And since then, there's been much more. Historically, also, we have quite a bit um, that's now been done by historians in terms of writing. There isn't enough done, and I can tell you from all the travel that I do, it, Travel quite extensively to very far flung parts of the world, which for me is a, what brought me to the UN to go to places in the world um, that have not uh, been accessed in terms of uh, justice, in terms of peace, in terms of atrocity crimes. And often I'm so struck by the fact of um, the lack of understanding, and not just in those places, even among leadership in the world, um, of what the word genocide means. Um, and even among, among people to whom atrocity crimes are happening, um, how often we have to explain to them that what is happening to you, there are risk factors for atrocity crimes. People don't recognize them. And you often see the peace building, um, which I know quite extensively because I worked in peace building for many years, the peace building uh, bandage being applied even to um, when places where we have risk factors for atrocity crimes. So I'm, I'm, when I say so, I would like you to imagine, um, like when we, during the Holocaust or during the genocide against the, the Tutsi in Rwanda, or during the genocide against the Bosnia Muslims in uh, Srebrenica, if somebody had tried to do peace building um, to stop it. So we do need to distinguish um, what uh, that is happening when clearly an identity is targeted for complete extinction, as happened in the Holocaust and in Srebrenica and in Rwanda for the reason that they exist and for no other reason, just because they exist. So um, the content of, of, of this convention is so important because it reminds us all that people deserve dignity irrespective of their race, ethnicity, nationality, religion, or gender. And so I know that I'm in the presence of friends. Uh, we work together for many years with many of you. And so I'm counting uh, on all of you to bring the content of this first ever human rights treaty to your organizations and communities and contribute to its implementation. And I do look forward to continuing partnering with religious leaders, actors, and faith based organizations to advance atrocity prevention mm -hmm. globally and make sure that the rights of each individual are respected without discrimination. This is a society that we aim for. This is a society that we want. And I would like to thank you. And once again, I apologize for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, Bani, do you want to, or shall I just continue in my usual? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much, Excellency, Ms. Dedito. This was an incredibly um, all-encompassing and very thoughtful. The formal words were well heard, as were your own reflections based on your tremendous experience and the partnerships that your office has managed to steward. We're very grateful to you for all this. 
Um, we have a wonderful panel, an absolutely remarkable panel of speakers um, that I am meant to um, to try to give the floor to. Um, we we are a, a bit uh, about twenty minutes behind schedule, so I am going to have to ask our uh, distinguished speakers to to do a bit of a fast forward of their incredibly important points, which we are actually meant to ponder, but given the lack of time, we may have to listen deeply and then ponder later together um, when we hear a recording or so. For the time being, I have a very distinguished panel. As I said, we have academic, scholars, policymakers, and faith leaders all together in this space, which is one of the many wonders of, um, of the intersection between the UN and the rest of civil society. The theme is a whole of society approach, but we're trying to nuance the role of faith leaders and religious actors in general. And so with that in mind, um, and without having to necessarily go into the intricacies any further, I have, I will ask our faith leaders to set the tone perhaps through their own thoughts. I have um, with us today is um, Dr. Sadvi Bhagavati Sarasvati, who is the Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance, which is an international interfaith organization dedicated to clean water. She's also the president of the Divine Shakti Foundation. And this is a foundation that runs free schools, vocational training programs, and empowerment programs. She has about 500 other hats that she wears with tremendous flair and pride. And they are all hats that relate to service roles. So this idea that religious leaders simply address people on specific days and um, we don't hear of them afterwards is something that is actively countered by our distinguished faith leaders on this panel. They are, they are not only those who address the hearts, as we heard from Ms. Bani Dougal earlier, the, the very hearts and the heartbeats of people, but they are also in many ways serving people's remarkable needs in different ways. So um, Ms. Dougal, with, if you'll allow me to start with you, um, could you tell me a little bit about how um, organizations have actually integrated the plan of action that we've heard of and that we've you've been part of the crafting of um, in your own purview of, of space, to what extent has the plan of action, ha uh, ha does it have an echo or a resonance within the work that you do? Would you, man would you mind please sharing with us some thoughts on that? And certainly, uh, as a, we, um, as uh, Her Excellency uh, Ms. Enderitu mentioned, were uh, involved in the uh, planning process and were involved as religious leaders brought to the table during the FES process and some of the other processes <clears throat> and had an opportunity to weigh in then. But then the important thing is to convey to um, our congregants and our collaborators, whether we are meeting in New York or in uh, a small town um, in a faraway place uh, in the world uh, about what these plans of action are and what uh, responsibilities religious uh, leaders and actors have to safeguard uh, the, the, the communities where they live and to build unity and to build uh, an atmosphere uh, which is safe and secure and um, can counter any possibilities of violent extremism. So I think that is one of the roles that uh, we have played, but we don't do anything by ourselves. We work alongside others who are doing a lot as well. And I look forward to also hearing from uh, some, uh, some other speakers. The only one thing I want to say is that sometimes we actually hear the religious leaders and actors perpetuating some of those tendencies of othering groups that may be new to a community that may be unknown. And I think that is part of the problem. And we have to own those um, uh, you know, impediments as well as uh, take some um, uh, uh, comfort in the fact that we are trying to make a difference. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Dougal. Um, Sadviji, Bhagavati Sarasvati, the question is now sort of um, directed to you to please give us some of your own reflections. You've just heard um, Ms. Dougal mentioned that some religious leaders and sometimes religious actors themselves can be part of the challenge of hate speech dissemination and um, marginalization of others, etc. What are your own reflections and thoughts based on your extensive work in uh, India as well as globally? Please share a few thoughts. First of all, it's so wonderful and such an honor to be joining together with you all with the special advisor, our Ms. Alice Nibiritu and her entire team and our faith-based family in deep, deep gratitude for the opportunity to be together today. The plan of action to end atrocity crimes and to build peaceful societies has been a program that we've been so glad to be part of. From the regional meetings in Bangkok to the launch at the United Nations with the Secretary General, to being able to organize youth programs at our base, our secretariat at Paramars Nikitan Rishikesh with Hindu and Muslim students. It's been really a blessing to be able to join together, hand in hand, heart in heart, with minds, messages, and missions aligned. We know that the role of faith, faith leaders, faith actors, faith organizations is essential. In the Bhagavad Gita, the core Hindu text, Lord Krishna teaches us that right speech, dharmic speech, yogic speech, must be that which is true, kind, and beneficial. So in a Hindu context, hate speech in and of itself, but especially that which leads to violence, atrocity, crimes, and terrorism is the greatest sin. I see this process that we've been on for the last several years as a four-I process information, inspiration, innovation, and implementation. We began with the information, the untold millions who were suffering. Then we had the inspiration and the innovation, which led to the FEZ process and the plan of action to end atrocity crimes. But now we continue to come together for inspiration and implementation to really take this further to actively counter terrorism and to build peaceful and inclusive societies. These crimes and violence are rooted in separation, in us versus them, in a dehumanization of the other. Psychologically, we know that under stress, we contract within ourselves and also within our communities. The borders and the boundaries between us become thicker and the lines between us get much thicker and less able to be moved. We get into a psychological survival mode and we stick closer to us and get more afraid of them. This inclination to scapegoat people and communities tragically seems to be a deeply embedded part of human psychological nature. And we saw this recently in COVID where fear of illness and death led to vilification, scapegoating, polarization. Whether we were pointing fingers at each other, blaming for super spreader events that ended up leading to not only violence, but just an adamant refusal to even buy fruits and vegetables from each other's carts or shops. We've been really fortunate to be part of the plan of action in a very direct way. We translated it into Hindi and have disseminated it on many occasions, including with both religious youth as well as with religious leaders. We've held webinars with leaders of different religions. We've done public service announcements that get disseminated on social media, on WhatsApp, by leaders of different uh, religions reaching out to this digital community. The challenges are those that we always face. 
shifting people's beliefs and perspectives, dissolving lines between us and them. And this is where on a specific level, we have found the power of working together against a common enemy. Fighting against a common enemy, whether it's poverty, stunting, climate change, loss of our planet's water, gender inequality, can serve as an invaluable tool in preventing that separation, competition, and dehumanization that we see so frequently. As far as working with faith actors and protection that was given to us, you know, in the, the beautiful concept note and guiding questions, I was thinking about that because working with faith actors and protecting them as best as they can is something that the United Nations has been doing very successfully for many years. To work with the UN, especially as religious leaders and aspects of separation and competition and polarization, it takes courage on the part of the faith actor and faith leader. The UN may or may not be able to protect them. Sometimes the threat is a physical threat of bodily harm. Sometimes it's threat of disdain from others in the community. I know we have faced it personally for the interreligious work that we do with the UN, but no one chooses a path of faith out of fear. We choose a path of faith from faith. And so I think that obviously the United Nations must do, continue to do all it can to protect those who work with it, especially in these fragile topics around atrocity crimes and terrorism. And I think that throughout history of faith, people have come forward courageously to stand for that which is right and true and in alignment with their understanding of a peaceful, loving God. And in conclusion, just to say that this is the courage that we need today for each of us in our different religions, leading different large religious communities to continue to stand anchored strongly in our own faith, but standing tall courageously together. Religion should give us the courage to resist that which must be resisted. True religious power is to own our no as much as our yes. And today, no must be said to practices that are violating the very principles of care, compassion, and love that our religions are based upon. We have that power as leaders of faith and as people inspired by faith to bring that peace for ourselves and our planet. And Thank it's a great honor to be together with you all for this and such gratitude for the opportunity. No, the gratitude for you, Sadviji. Um, this was beautiful. And now, um, if I may direct a question to Rabbi Vysotsky, um, you've heard what um, Sadviji, Dr. Sadviji has mentioned in terms of the courage to say no, the courage to stand up against the current that might be a current of obvious hate speech and discriminatory language and actions. What are your thoughts um, on the, the critical role that these different religious leaders play in countering hate speech and preventing violent extremism? They're not one and the same thing. Maybe you can share a few thoughts, please, Rabbi Vysotsky. Thank you, Professor Karam. And I, I also want to thank uh, uh, Special Advisor Alice Nidaritu uh, and Her Excellency's remarks really resonated with me and uh, our the hospitality of Bonnie Dougal. I'm always happy to see Bonnie. I, I also should note that we owe a debt of gratitude not only to Adama Dieng, who was the special advisor before Ellis, but to Simona Cruciani. Uh, Simona has been there for us nonstop doing the hard work. And I just, I want to recognize her efforts because she's just, without her, we would be nowhere. Um, as always, I learn um, by listening to Sadviji. And I, I want to underscore something she said with a very simple exhortation to everyone. Um, those of us on the committee worked very hard to produce a plan of action. So let me start by recommending that all religious leaders should read the plan of action. Um, it is a document worth study. 
Um, second of all, I open with thank yous because I wanted to model gratitude. We should be grateful to one another. And the more we as religious leaders, as trusted actors can do that, the more we can teach our congregants and our students that there are others who are not our enemy, but people with whom we should and can be grateful. We should respect and esteem the other rather than scorn them. Um, I also appreciate Sadviji's notion that you do need to know when to say no. It's very easy to be seduced to uh, scorning the other, but sometimes our yes has to trump that no. We need to educate our youth and our co-religionists not towards disdain and hatred. Too many people use their pulpits to disdain the other. We have a tendency to compare our best with their worst. Well, that's not only unfair, it's a little too facile and easy. We need to recognize our own faults. That's a good first step. We should acknowledge the best of our others. And even better, as I've just done from Sadviji, um, learn how to be better in our service to God and humanity. That includes, of course, raising up women and minorities, seeing others as allies and not enemies, promoting dialogue over debate. And I dare say the hardest thing that we all need to learn to do, and I'm speaking very personally here, the hardest thing I need to learn to do is to listen. Listening is a skill that is difficult to acquire. We need to hear someone fully. We need to hear them as themselves, not simply in contrast to us. Um, we should listen and hear them rather than simply be preparing to give our rebuttal. Um, the sages, the rabbinic sages say, Ezehu chacham in Hebrew, who is wise? The one who learns from every person. So we should take that advice. We should learn from every person. The plan of action is detailed, but if I could summarize it with one commandment from the Torah, it is this, love your neighbor as yourself. That neighbor means the stranger. That neighbor means your co-religionist. That neighbor means the other. If we can learn to love our neighbors, we will go a long way to implementing the plan of action. Um. Thank you very much indeed, Rabbi Vysotsky, um, for that uh, very gracious and on the point and to the point, and also the, uh, um, an answer that exemplified the points you made about being uh, grat grateful uh, for one another and looking after one another. And in the spirit of looking after one another, given the fact of that we're quickly running short of time, um, I would like to please ask uh, Reverend Dr. Ibrahim Yusuf, uh, the same reflections, please, uh, on what you've heard so far in terms of the role of religious actors in preventing hate speech and violent extremism. Thank you uh, very much for this opportunity <laughs> to share just very brief reflections on the implementation of the plan of action. Let me start by saying that actually, even before the plan of action was launched in 2017, Religious leaders have been committed and engaged in ensuring that they address the issue of violence extremism. That is why the plan action was a collection of the experiences and the learning that has been going on even before the plan of action was, uh, you know, launched. But the plan of action really re encourage and also support the work of the religious leaders. I understand that from my very many years of experience in working in a multi-religious environment coming from Nigeria, we have really seen the danger that violence extremism has posed to the nation in terms of the death tolls, destruction of properties, and destruction of trust among the people that have lived together. And when I joined the World Council of Churches in 2020, and my area of jurisdiction or responsibilities focuses in Africa, and the 
continued engagement in contexts like South Sudan, Sudan, DRC, Cameroon, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Nigeria, has really exposed me to the commitment, the desire of the religious leaders in terms of combating the issues of religious extremism. Because they don't need to be told to do so. Like in the Christian faith, it is a mandate. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And in that same Matthew chapter 5, verse 42 to 45, said, Love your enemy, love your enemy, and pray for those who persecute you. That is really calling on all religious leaders, especially Christians, to walk for peace and counter the issue of hate speech and violence extremism. What brings about all this is a lack of you know, good governance, especially in, 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 in the region of Africa, lack of good policies by the political leadership. Then if we, we will really approach this issue very well, we will need a very good collaboration. My experience has shown that some of the religious, that is political leaders do not give the religious leaders the needed support and cooperation. So all their effort sometimes have been, you know, they don't yield the positive that is resolved. So we have been engaged in terms of convening, that is meeting workshops to educate, mobilize and strengthen the capacity of the member churches, the religious community in this context we work with, knowing fully that they have to work together. As somebody rightly said, nobody decides to be created as a Muslim or as a Christian. We are all created by God. And looking at the text and the holy books, we are all one before God. Even the Bible says in John chapter 3, for God so loved the world. The world includes all faiths, including Christian, Buddhist, Islam, and everybody. If God loved all and gives the ear to all, and everybody breathe the same breath that we need to really work hard to counter the effect, the destruction, the hatred that has been resulted as a result of violence, extremism. However, in our work, let me just share a very quick experience that the, one of the challenges we have is that this act, plan of action sometimes has not gotten to the grassroots. How do we get it across the levels? Not only at the global, at the national, but what about the grassroots? How do we get to them? How do we strengthen? Because in many community society in the countries we work in Africa, sometimes the participation of women is still very slow. Participation of the youth, very slow. How do we promote that? How do we address the unseen hands? There are hands that are not seen. They are behind the scene, but they promote all these violence atrocities. How do we identify them? How do we address them? Like the context of Cameroon, most of the people that sponsored the, 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 the crisis are not in Cameroon. Like the context of Boko Haram in Nigeria, those that are found on the, that is on the act are arrested. They cannot afford to buy one weapon. How do they get the weapons? Who send the weapons? And if this violence that is extremist don't have the weapon, they will stop. But because they have free flow of these ammunitions and they use it at will, that encourage their action. So we will need also some support to support and back up the activities and the effort of the religious leaders. For now, let me say thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend Dr. Mashishi. This was a very uh, passionate and passionately expressed wisdom. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Emina Friliak, I think those of uh, you around on this call who have heard us speak or have heard me speak since my days in the UN know that we have actively urged for a definition, a redefinition of religious leadership to include women of faith who are serving in their communities. And it is in that uh, under that guise of active 
leadership that I'd like to call upon Ms. Emina Frijak to share her thoughts. And also, Emina, given, given the multiple spaces you speak for and from within and that you serve, maybe you could not just say a few of your thoughts on what you've heard already expressed from the um, distinguished religious leaders proper, but perhaps you can share also from the perspective of a relatively more sort of youthful uh, space of service within religious communities, as well as perhaps a nod, if you can, to the issue of um, technology and artificial intelligence that seems to be very not, not yet touched upon in this space. Please, the floor is yours, Emina. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Karam. Uh, good afternoon and assalamu alaikum from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, I will now reflect that and start with the uh, with the sentence that countering hate speech is the responsibility for each and every one of us, but what comes with an extra responsibility for the religious actors, and I'm using the word actors, is the fact that people trust them and people listen to them. But I also want to emphasize that for too long we have been hearing the narrative that the religion is the source of conflict. And of course, history showed us it was the source of violence. It was the source of the conflict. But I think it's important that we as religious actors work on shifting this narrative that religion is not only the source of conflict, religion is also a source of peace. And it depends on us as religious actors, how are we going to misuse it or how we are going to use it in a, in a good manner. But also it's important that we don't trap into, the, uh, into this, I would say, uh, trap of religious per perpetual peacefulness. We have to be aware of what was happening and we have to be aware how religion is misused in certain places. But concretely, what I would say uh, that religious actors and religious leaders could do is first, I think that in the sermons, in the lectures, religious leaders should speak much more about hate speech. They should use the tradition they come from to provide examples of importance of the good, of the positive speech, and of the positive behavior. There should be also used faith-inspired language, which is the language that, that will be appeal to people, the language that people understand and people can connect to based on their religious tradition. And there is an amazing example from the evangelical church in Germany that they created 10 commandments for thriving in a digitally changing world. And I will send a link later on for you to see it. Also, it's very important that we address hate speech in our own communities. When it comes in our own community, we need to address it. And it's just not, it's not just religious leaders, it's every person active in a certain community that needs to address this hate speech. We need to talk to the people who are spreading hate speech to understand why this hate speech is being produced. And we need to show also compassion and understanding for the people who are spreading hate speech to understand where, where, where the hate speech is coming from. And needless to say here is that it's important that religious leaders themselves refrain from using hate speech and incitement to violence. Also, it's important that we as communities, as actors, be it women, be it youth, be it religious leaders, speak out when other communities are targeted because it's very powerful message and statement when faith communities are standing with each other and giving support. And finally, I want to say that social media plays a huge role. So it's very important link in the chain of addressing hate speech. We need to shape our messages as religious communities, creating an alternative to hate speech by showcasing our examples of cooperation, of interfaith dialogue that we are doing in our communities, of encounters, et cetera, et cetera. Also, we can use social media to condemn hateful messages and ask people to restrict and refrain themselves from using hate speech. And just to conclude, it's important and I feel responsibility to say that religious actors need support from civil society, from their communities, from the national, regional, and international institutions, and they need to be protected. Because sometimes in some areas, it's really, really dangerous to speak out, and we have to count on that risk. And sometimes, even in their own communities, religious actors and religious leaders are becoming ostracized and becoming targets of hate speech themselves. Thank you.
Thank you very much for that. Um, I think you've brought up a couple of incredibly important issues related to it's one thing to call upon religious leaders to be courageous. It's quite another thing to try to be protective of those who have been courageous, often at great peril to themselves. Um, in so doing. And I think that is a space that the international community, particularly the UN, has a very important role, indeed a moral obligation to play. It's one thing to engage religious leaders. It's quite another thing to be actively involved in um, protecting those who speak out uh, and speak truth to power. And thank you also for pointing out the role of uh, the whole of society approach where secular civil society actors uh, also need to accept and work alongside religious actors, but religious actors also need to accept and work alongside secular actors. And sometimes even in the height of times of tension and conflict, issues of certain issues of human rights can be a massive barrier to some of those abilities and opportunities to stand together on matters of principle. And maybe with that, um, with that very important set of points from Ms. Imina, we shift a little bit to the practitioner scholars who have been in this space and have been informing and still continue to be leaders of thought and praxis. And maybe I can call upon Dr. Ahmed Shahid, um, a professor of international human rights law, and until very recently, also the special rapporteur on issues of freedom of religion and belief, Dr. Shahid, what do you what have you seen very concretely as the value of religious actors in the development and implementation of international human rights law in this space as well please uh, thank you very much professor azakaram uh, before i comment on the question posed to me i may express my uh, you know um joy to join this group again to talk about this important subject not to recognize the very important uh, statement made by Her excellency alessandra ritu at the beginning of the session and of course, uh, to Bani, da Bani Duga for hosting us uh, in her lovely office in, in New York. Um, if I can just come to the, if you like, cut to the chase on, on, on the question you raised here. I mean, at the end of my six years work at the UN, I wish I had quoted more, more often what Jonathan Swift had said, that we seem to have just about enough religion to hate one another, but not enough to love one another. I think uh, the big lesson the UN should take is that it should engage more with religious uh, religions and just leaders and actors uh, 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 than they do right now. And by I also note that UN doesn't use a definition of religion. So in the work I did, religion and non-religion were given, are given equal weight. So also not, not in the work of the plan of action, it was developed. We had our sisters and brothers from Humanist International also contribute to this. So that, that inclusivity uh, is, is important. Um, um, in terms of you know, a very quick response to you, I want to argue that a lot of the problems that we face in today in regard to the rise of hate speech um, and of course extremist violence, uh, violent extremism can be traced to the uh, development of the neoliberal model that you went seem to have taken on board. This resulted in hollowing out the role of the state. The state has is no longer able to offer anything beyond just defense and safety of people. And of course the development actors try to fill this space, but for centuries, for millennia, that's a space where I think the faith-based actors have been most useful, most most active in, and that's and that connection has been made uh, by 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 UN, if you like, you know, actors in operating in, in this space. In regards to developing a human rights law, I mean, all of us here know we are at the 75th anniversary of the UDHR, uh, and the contributions to it, a lot of it came from faith-based actors, especially those elements that spoke about social justice. And that's the underlying theme, I think, uh, of where what's going wrong uh, in, in, the world, uh, in the world today. So those aspects about gender equality, those aspects uh, about uh, social protection, these came from uh, religious, uh, uh, religious uh, uh, you know, faith-based actors. Even the idea of universal human rights, human dignity, that also comes from a, a source of faith uh, and, and belief. So that, that is an, a very, very important um, uh, dimension. Moving towards the, the practice, I think if I can refer to three things that I sort to emphasize or, or be guided by in my work. One of course is social justice. The idea of being very inclusive in what we do. Uh, go to a country, listen to the people, understand the context, learn from them, and then work with them. And uh, not just the, you know, those who are, are dominant situations, but, but everybody. Uh, the second, of course, is the notion of religious lit lit uh, literacy. We need to learn more about faiths. We need to go, delve deeper into it so that, like as Jonathan Swift has said, 
we get enough of religion we have to love one another than to than just to, you know to do a scheme of it to, to hate each other be, be different third element is allyship fostering uh, uh, allyship across people of different faiths and and and, and, and belief because unless we are, we are, we prepare to work with one another in that spirit of solidarity we wouldn't succeed and one of the things we should remember is that you know the rise of hatred that we are seeing today around the world and i i recall we are meeting at the fringes of the counter terrorism week uh, uh, today um is the so called politics of fear fear has become the currency of power um you know it's used to gain power it's used to maintain power it's the only thing i think that sells most for those who seek uh, seek power and that seeks to create a reality for people not not the actual reality but a, 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 a framing of, of facts to create a, a false reality through which people can if you like you know hate each other or distrust each other so these actors are in a very i think good position to counter that because even where states are failing faith based actors have legitimacy because they work with the people they are of the people and they understand the people and they are in the position to if you like you know uh, exercise the discursive influence required to reframe these discourses to one about solidarity inclusion and allyship so i think that role has to be understood in translating abstract international law into practice and identifying gaps in the practice and make them go up to uh, pro- uh, offer normative protections for every, everybody i think i should end here for the moment thank you very much thank you very much indeed dr shahid for that also uh, brilliant um targeting of points um dr mohammed el sanusi you are stewarding a network of religious and traditional peace builders uh, globally and you come from uh, an interreligious background and a very important uh, islamic space before you join the network and your own experience and studies have delved into aspects of islamic law so what would you be able to share with this distinguished community about some of those issues of whether it's the plan of action you which you to which you've also contributed greatly as part of a, a steering group of religious uh, actors and leaders and faith-based ngo representatives what are your own thoughts whether on the plan of action or on the journey you have been stewarding over the last few years with different uh, religious and traditional peacemakers Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Karam. And uh, let me just acknowledge also your leadership, uh, Professor Karam, for this particular space in advancing interreligious collaboration, um, you know, addressing all the crises that we're, we're facing today. And also, I want to, of course, to uh, thank and appreciate uh, my sister, uh, Sister Madame Alice Derito. Uh, the special advisor under secretary general for her leadership uh, to continue implementing the plan of action as well as um, introducing new new projects that also can help uh, to prevent extremism as well um, i want to thank uh, bani as well and the bahai international center for hosting us and i also wanted really to reiterate uh what my brother bazaski has said um the critical role that uh, simona played in term of her leadership uh to organizing and leading all of us as a steering committee and also working closely with the previous special advisor to come up with this plan of action and um i clearly remember we traveled the world uh with some simona um committed really to this very critical documents uh for religious actors around the world um i am sitting here in tunisia and i remember our visit with simona uh, to tunisia when she had very young children with her as well at the time trying to find the ways uh, to not only um implementing and thinking about the plan of actions but also the integration of the plan of action with other un documents that were produced whether it is rabat plan of actions and other un documents that help to support and advance um, human rights uh, but uh, professor karam just to um to your to answer your question this plan of action is actually very critical for us as we continue to work in the interreligious space also for the muslim communities as a whole around the world these particular documents now became a must use 
documents in terms of increasing capacity and training religious actors, regardless of any specific religious affiliations. Of course, you know, the Muslim communities, they adapted, they use it, uh, became a platform for religious communities really to use and adapt to their own, their own context so that they can increase their own capacity to prevent as well as to mitigate uh, crisis. Through, uh, since the launch of the plan of actions, the implementation journey um, jointly with the Office of the Prevention of Genocide and the Steering Committee, we went to a number of countries actually to implement the plan of action. Uh, just really uh, to mention a few, um, those countries include, but not limited to what I'm going to say now, um, we were in, 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 a, in a major conference in Vienna um, talking about, you know, the power of the plan of action and the power of words as well. Uh, we traveled to uh, Thailand, um, with the office, we went to Bangladesh, we engaged religious actors in Helsinki and, and other places um, to find the best way to implement this plan of action. From our engagement with religious actors, Professor Karam, also we came to know some of the lessons learned also from this implementation. Um, just to mention a few of those lessons learned that um, the recommendations from this implementations engagement um, they ask clearly how we can map the existing initiatives that could also contribute to the implementations of the plan of action. Second, how we can develop the capacity, uh, building the capacity and activities for religious leaders and actors, and how we can promote through this plan of action interreligious dialogue and understanding, and how we can enhance the engagement of youth and women's and marginalized communities as well. So this is uh, the religious community that are saying, we do have a documents now, we need to implement the documents and we need to use the document uh, to strengthen our own, the work that we have been doing at the Religious Action uh, actually for, for a long time. So we also face some challenges, uh, Professor Karam, as we continue the implementation. Well, just to mention a few, and my colleagues earlier talked about you know, the trust building as well. We also, through the collaboration of the, uh, the plan of action, we also um, um, came up with, uh, we found the challenge that the religious leaders who are engaging to implement the plan of actions, their safety and security is also in question. We don't have a current mechanism that can provide safety and security for those religious actors who are working through this plan of action and speaking from their own religious platforms. Again, it's violent extremism, again, it's genocide. We have seen imams were killed in Mali. We know that. And, and, and other religious actors were killed in other uh, you know, uh, circumstances because, but because they, they are vocal against extremism as well. We also seen that the credibility of religious actors is also was in a question when we work also closely with local governments and all of that. So these are some of the challenges we really need to navigate, but I will turn it to you, Professor Karam. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Sanusi. And thank you also for highlighting the, the criticality of protection for those who do speak out. I think that this theme is coming out very powerfully amongst all of you. And it is an incredibly important theme because it's one thing to talk about having the tools. It's quite another thing to look at how we can honor and include protect, including protect those who are serving to uphold the principles and the actions necessary to effectively stop um, hate speech at a time when hate speech is actually becoming a very new normal in many parts of the world. So it is not easy to stand against it. It becomes extremely difficult to do so. I think if I may, Dr. Senussi, a gentle point for all to consider before I come to our, my um, esteemed guru in this space, and that is uh, Do Professor Dr. Catherine Marshall. Before I come to you, Dr. Marshall, I just want to nuance a point uh, on this issue of protection that as we endeavor to, to make so many meetings, to host so many meetings in different cities and different parts of the world uh, in which we convene, 
uh, religious leaders and different religious actors around these issues of violent extremism, hate speech, peace building in general, um, those of us who, who sit in authority or spaces of decision making actually owe an obligation for protection to all of these people that we gather. We can't always point the finger to someone else, to a governmental or government body, to uh, other actors in civil society, to the UN. I think there's an obligation on the part of the leaders of this uh, religious spaces themselves to look after and be protective of those that they are convening um, to speak out truth to power. Religions for Peace has been very diligent in trying to serve this space in many parts of the world, as most especially when we convened religious leaders in Tokyo from conflict countries, when in their own countries, they are on opposite sides of a very, very disturbing, real life costing war. But they came out of their countries to a space where they could speak with one another as equals. And it was extraordinarily important not simply to convene them, that is the easiest thing ever, in spite of the cost of it, but it was extraordinarily important to secure their protection while they were there with one another. And I think just being savvy and, and cognizant of this of this effort is an important part of speaking about the, the role of them uh, or the importance of protecting faith leaders um, and those who speak out. Um, Professor Dr. Catherine Marshall, you have stewarded this space for over, um, well, let's not age you, for some time. You've actually been one of the first in the international community under the aegis of the World Bank to bring religious leaders together to speak about what it is that they do. What are some of your thoughts in this domain of um, hate speech and violent extremism and the plan of action? And from what you've heard now from the distinguished speakers, what are some of the thoughts you would care to ensure you leave us with? Thank you, Azra. Uh, I think we've heard some of the epitome of the wisdom and the insight and the courage that we are all looking to for our religious leaders, our religious prophets, our religious actors. We've heard about love. We've heard about courage. Uh, we've heard about cooperation, um, perhaps less than we might have the the real need for cooperating uh, among the different re religious leaders standing together. Uh, those themes have, uh, have been a remarkable. I think what I would say first is, is just the sense of the urgency of the moment that we're living. And this confluence of different problems and different crises, which seem so intertwined, so tangled, that you can't separate hunger uh, from war, from the fate of children, uh, from climate change, uh, from migration, uh, from refugees. The, the five Ps of the sustainable development goals come back all the time, people, prosperity, peace, um, pros uh, partnership, uh, and planet. Um, the, the, the urgency of the moment that we really have no time. And if anything, the conflicts, the tensions, the polarization, which is behind the hate speech seems to become more urgent with every day, the inequality and the sense of deep unfairness that in, is driving at least a part of the, of the hate speech and the anger uh, that we worry about. I think if I can, and we need to be very short because the time is so short, I think one piece of this, which I've not heard mentioned and which to me is very urgent is to reach across different sectors. Uh, it, one of the key issues has been for the non-religious actors, the secular, so-called secular, um, to appreciate, to understand, to engage uh, with the religious communities. Uh, but even more for the religious communities to engage uh, with even business, with civil society, with um, women's organizations uh, across the world, uh, people who deal with economics, um, as Sadvi uh, highlighted, water, um, sanitation, the basically the whole realm of the sustainable development goals, uh, the 
the issues, the activists, people who are so passionate about climate change. I think if we don't move beyond a sort of sense of the religious actors operating in their own complicated octopus-like space, um, into the other domains, uh, the others of this of the five P's, uh, we cannot address the issues that we're facing today, the extraordinary uh, challenges uh, of of peace, uh, but also the prosperity that is part of the um, of the economic challenges, the debt issues, uh, and so forth. That, as I said before are a part of the fear, which is linked to anger, which is linked to this deep sense of unfairness of the multiple standards that is guiding too many of the policy makers in the world. Uh, so I think that the plan of action is a remarkable achievement in bringing together so many voices. I think it's time to, to work beyond that. Uh, and to understand that the kinds of tensions that we're so concerned about involve everyone, whether they come from a religious perspective or work from a religious perspective, or whether they're the economists, um, the so-called neoliberal, which I will refrain from commenting on here, but the, the questions of, of what kind of world are we creating and how do we address for the next generation the problems we're facing? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Dr. Marshall, I think that nicely brings um, the chapeau, the heading, the form, um, and also addresses so much of the content that runs through what many of our um, distinguished colleagues have been speaking to. Um, if I may, maybe just to uh, require some of you to, uh, first of all, all of us need to pay attention to some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, we know I'm just gonna run through them and then um, in, ask some of you to please address some of them. Um, Dilshan from Pakistan notes that Pakistan is an Islamic country, uh, but the ministries are not safe. Uh, there is There are serious minority related uh, issues in this country most especially to Christian minorities. Um, we also have a similar note set, resounding from uh, Mesfin, but this one from Ethiopia, saying we've got plenty of mechanisms in place to counter hate crimes, terrorism, and genocide. And yet hate crimes, terrorism, and genocide remain prevalent in so many parts of the world. Um, why? I think is the main question, why, in spite of the mechanisms, in spite of the rhetoric, in spite of the narratives and the laws and the policies, why does this remain prevalent? I think that's an incredibly important question. Many of you have tried to answer it in different ways, but if I was to ask for a one sentence answer to why the prevalence is there of these atrocities, can we get just one answer? Rabbi Vysotsky, what's your one sentence answer? I, I think it's written somewhere in scripture, but um, there's yeah. that famous line, haters gonna hate. Um, this is just the reality we face, that there are people, individuals in the world, I don't know why, but there are people who will hate and who will teach hate. And this is a challenge for all of us. And I think we have to counter it at its very earliest stages, counter it by teaching our youth and teaching love. That is the that is the antidote to hate. Right. So maybe not from now, from such a religious perspective, let's let's ask um, Dr. Shahid. You've been you've been looking at this at the realm of this of this stuff from a very global perspective uh, for for much of your career. Why is this still prevalent and pervasive, Dr. Shahid? I think uh, Rabbi, but it's correct that hate will always uh, you know be there. But I also want to say that what we are dealing with are the symptoms of a much deeper issue that has gone on for a very long time unaddressed. And um, what we see today are the fruits of the capture of the education systems, both formal, informal, the media, and so on and so forth. 
And so we need now go and reclaim those spaces for inclusivity, allyship and cross-sectional cross engagement. And without going to the, if you like, the bedrock of these spaces through which hatred is being promoted, we will not begin to turn the tide. So I think that is possible to do, I have hope, but I think we need to do a lot more than what we are doing now. We need to go, go actually to the root of this. And that would be the, the, the very foundations of the discursive system through which hate has been promoted. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shahid. Dr. Sadvi Bhagavati Sarasvati, please. Why is this still going on? Why do we still hate? I think the root core of it is really related to fear. I think that if you look at who we hate, we tend to hate those who in some way we feel are encroaching upon something that should be ours or something that should be of people whom we consider ours. So whether it's land, whether it's power, whether it's resources, whatever it may be, I think the core of this really is a sense of fear. We tend not to hate those who have absolutely nothing to do with us, those who we do not encounter in our daily lives, those who are relegated to some <clears throat> far off, far off point of the world that we have nothing to do with. We tend to hate those with whom there is some level of requirement to cohabit or coexist in a community, in a society, in a nation, whatever it may be. And this is where I think our faiths are so important. I mean, what is the antidote to fear? It's faith. And I think as people of faith and as leaders of faith, it's so critical for us to help people move beyond fear, beyond a scarcity mindset that enables them to stop fearing and therefore hating and feeling aggressive toward the other. And just to reiterate what was just said, I think education is critical in this. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Sadviji. Um, might I now please direct two last questions to um, specifically to uh, Dr. Ibrahim and to Emina, two voices that may not necessarily look like they're very much aligned. But Emina, one particular question that came is from Dr. Crescencia Gabijan from the University of Santo Tomas in Manila. Um, it must be very late their time here, so please do make a point of addressing this. Um, who expressed a concern about issues related to artificial intelligence um, and the new generations. Um, the specific question is, can religious leaders and actors create space for more discussion on the positive side of social media to deter hate speech and violent extremism? We all know how active you have been uh, with Religions for Peace, with United Religions Initiative in, in addressing and serving in the social media space. Can you maybe just say a, a few things on this, please? Yes, absolutely, Professor Karam. So I'll try to be um, as concise as possible. So uh, there is a lot of going on in this field, and there are a lot of initiatives going on. But um, I also would like to emphasize the initiative that we had as the European Interfaith Youth Network of Religions for Peace under the platform of Speech for Change and our uh, campaign, Other Hate. And uh, as young people, we decided, uh, of course, to work with religious leaders, with women of faith and, and young people. Um, and we organized a campaign uh, and we also organized a series of webinars where we discussed precisely these topics together in uh, cooperation with religious leaders, women of faith and youth, like creating this intergenerational dialogue. So these things are happening. And I also want to emphasize the poster that we created as young people called No Hate Speech Rule Poster. We decided to dive deep into the 11 different religious traditions and seek quotes um, that are encouraging positive speech, that are encouraging non-harmful speech and speech that is actually, you know, helping people to connect. So we created a poster with these 11 different traditions and this poster is highly uh, widely disseminated and it's available online it's sort of a let's say free resource that everybody can use in their own work uh pointing out a connection of how religion can contribute to decreasing hate speech and it can be even a resource for religious leaders within their own traditions how they can address hate speech and especially for young people and women so this is one of the initiatives that's come to my mind and i also have to say that religions for peace also convened certain webinars 
especially connecting young people, connecting religious leaders and connecting women of faith to discuss these issues and to use social media. And I have to mention our youth media team that is working really hard, that is doing tremendous work on countering hate speech, but also on using social media to you know, uplift religious contribution to peace and religious contribution to countering extremism. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Emina. I see that we also now, the last question, and in answering it, I will ask for the concluding aspect here, which is a question from Rachel Forster from Search for Common Ground, who's asking a very basic question. Are there any lessons learned and best practices we can draw from places where religious actors were actively engaged in prevention or countering violent extremism efforts? alongside others, and she mentions the United Nations, governments, security forces, non-faith-based civil society organizations, youth, women, etc. Now, um, this the ask is for a specific example. So I'm going to request Dr. El Sanusi to reference some of the extensive work that the network has done on its own, but also with many other partners. And I think we all started this with, um, her Excellency Miss Alice in Dorito speaking about the plan of action, which actually draws on so many of these efforts that are taking place around the world where religious actors have been partnering. So um, Rachel, perhaps as a first, please do check out the plan of action. Look at the work of the um, of the special rapporteur, special rep, uh, Miss Alice in Dorito and her office. You've heard mention of a lot of this work. Please do uh, peruse it because it does reference tremendous work. But perhaps we could listen a little bit to Dr. El Sanusi from a personal vantage point, also as a leader of the Network of Religious and Traditional Peace Builders. Dr. Osinus. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Karam. I mean, it's a rich discussion. And let me begin by actually just mentioning the first question. Um, there is still lack of recognition of the soft power that we're talking about. That is the role of religious and traditional actors and bringing peace. Not enough resources dedicated to the soft power, more resources dedicated to the hard power. In, you know, in spite of the successes that we see actually in soft power, the role of religious actors, we have seen, I can give you a number of examples and connecting these particular examples with the social media as well. We engage in a project supported by the, by the EU commission um, to basically address issues of hate and discrimination in Southeast Asia in four countries, Bangladesh, um, Pakistan, as well as India and Sri Lanka. And, and, and the project called AHA, Awareness for Human Actions. And it's a social media during COVID to address discrimination. So the AHA project, we reach, the, U, the, the EU asked us to reach about 30, 30 million, uh, basically um, um, youth and people of different background, but we reached to 72 million people. So, so, so really there is that potential when we bring resources for those actors. Professor Karam, with the Religions for Peace, we were on the ground in Central African Republic, talking to you know, the Christian communities and the Muslim communities, and through the interreligious platform, NCAR, and Religions for Peace was with the, in the ground, the Secretary General of the Africa Interreligious Council, Francis Kuria, was there with us. So, so we talked to the people and we brought them together. So we have a number of successful examples that we can use. And then the plan of action, of course, help us tremendously uh, to do that on the ground. We will turn the plan of action to the religious leaders. This is a resource you should use. It tells us about how to deal with media. It tells you how to deal and to involve meaningfully women and marginalized communities. It tells you how to give leadership to the youth. It tells you how to use your own scripture to address your context, the contextual that uh, situation that you are in, using your own scriptures to interpret your scripture for your own context so that you can close the door for any uh, theology or context that is coming from outside and trying to enforce in your own context. So the plan of action really is a great platform. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. El Sanusi. I think that um, that is a very, very wise, comprehensive note that brings on together all the different organizations. Um, this will not be complete, however, without listening to Dr. Wushishi, um, Reverend Dr. Wushishi. Please um, enlighten us with your wisdom as a comment to the questions that have been raised so far, most especially about the concrete examples of where religious leaders have served in alliance with or in partnerships with many different and critical sectors. Please, Dr. Wushishi. Thank you very much. Let me start with the issue of intelligence. Uh, that is uh, the, uh, uh, the one you just asked about uh, artificial intelligence. I think the WCC has a program dedicated to that. Even today, we're in the Central Committee. That was one of the conversation. A staff is working on that in, in artificial intelligence and uh, a killer robot is an advocacy issue mobilizing the churches. And a concrete example of how religious communities work together, uh, the World Council of Churches has accompanied the Muslim and Christian community in Nigeria to support them after a high level interfaith visit in 2012. One of the things identified was the need to have a space and uh, a platform where Christian and Muslim could meet and then discuss issues that could lead to promoting uh, peaceful collaboration and uh, uh, countering all this violence terror that is uh, extremism. So today we have the center located in Kaduna. Uh, the center is called International Center for Interfaith Peace and Harmony. It is composed of 10 board members the Sultan of Sokoto, the president of Islamic Council of Nigeria, is a co-chair of the center. The Christian Council of Nigerian president is a co-chair. We have five uh, Muslims, five Christians in the board. We have 10 staff, five Christian, five Muslims. In all the implementation of the program since 2016, it has always been on the basis of 50-50. They work with the Christian, the, religious leaders, they work with women, they work with children, they even engage with the schools, the secondary school in a program that say, catch them young, helping them to start some a kind of club, peace club, interfaith uh, peace club that will help them to interact and also work together. Some of the government, like Kaduna State Government, Nasara State Government has issued a strong comment to the center and inviting them to please go through the schools and implement the program. But the challenge is the funding is not there. That is a big challenge. So that is a very good practical example of how the WCC, apart from other contexts, that notwithstanding the collaboration between the various you know, faiths, now we're working in Cameroon, we're planning for international interfaith, that is interfaith, national interfaith summit that will be coming up in, in August this year where the Muslim community, the Christian community, both from the Anglophone and Francophone Cameroon will come together and they reflect on this issue. How do they together can tell and then prevent this kind of killings and extremism that is happening in their country? Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Wushishi, Reverend Dr. Wushishi, for giving us this very concrete and practical example. I had not heard of this before. Thank you so much for that level of concreteness and detail of a very concrete issue taking place. Much appreciated. Um, this brings us to a close of the discussions of this panelist. I wish to thank every single distinguished member and speaker of this panel. Um, if I may, uh, Ms. Dougal, just a, a couple of points, since this is my last role to serve um, in in as the representative of Religions for Peace, I just wish to share a few uh, parting comments. First of all, to reiterate and echo the thanks made by each of the panelists for the presence of and the time made by each of them to be here together, most especially, but absolutely not only, to Her Excellency Miss Alice Indiritu for having her office consistently convene and co-convene with the uh, ACT Alliance, with um, the Network of Religious and Traditional Peacebuilders, with Religions for Peace, 
with the World Council of Churches um, and with the Baha'i International Community, which is perhaps um, very noteworthy in its ability not only to contribute intellectually and practically, but also to be a host in this space to all of us, which is hugely necessary. We're all running around, but a place that brings us together is a place of grace and it is a place of sacred presence. And for that, we wish to give special thanks to uh, Ms. Vani Dougal and her uh, remarkable colleagues at the Baha'i International Community. I also want to say a special word of gratitude to colleagues in Religions for Peace. Uh, Ms. Deepika Singh, I understand, is there. Uh, Ms. Christine Lizette Leonardo, who uh, endeavored to prepare a, a beautiful briefing note and uh, for all of us, actually, it's not just for me, but it, it works for us all. Um, and to all the colleagues and the Secretariat of Religions for Peace International, um, whom I have missed and will continue to miss uh, for, for the years to come, but I hope them, I wish them a great deal of, of uh, perseverance and grace in their work. I also want to say a couple of words of warning. I think it is all very good that we, we can pat our, our religious leaders and interreligious organizations on the back and urge them to continue to, con to continue with their very, very excellent work, which is hugely necessary. I also think that it's important for us to, uh, to uh, realize that it isn't about an absence of resources. I've heard this being repeated by many, it's absence of resources. We don't have enough resources. The fact is that especially within the religious communities, um, the, ho the whole point of the grace of faith is that people have been able to do so much with so little, to serve so many with very little. If the mantra, of religious NGOs becomes we don't have enough resources. We are repeating the mantra of secular NGOs around the world, which goes around saying we don't have resources. And the truth of the matter is that what the religious communities bring to the table through their authentic, long established, deeply, deeply reaching institutions is precisely not just ordinary resources, but a, an abundance of resources, human, financial, structural, et cetera. That the whole point is that religious organizations and communities cannot be exactly the same as the rest of the secular civil society, bemoaning the lack of resources. They need to be exemplifying what happens when they pool their different rich resources together. They can do a great deal. Religions for Peace was able to set up a humanitarian fund um, and it called upon all to say, please contribute. Um, we wish to thank the uh, Risha Kosekai Buddhist community. We wish to thank our colleagues in the Baha'i international community for exemplifying that willingness to contribute a little which becomes a lot when it is contributed by many. And I think this is, this is the charge that I would like to leave this esteemed space with. It isn't about absence. It is about actually exemplifying and celebrating the abundance of resources that religious communities in their incredible plethora of forms do already bring to the table. Speak of abundance of resources as you work together. Please be deliberate in acknowledging that when God gave, he doesn't just give money. That when the creator provides, he doesn't just provide materially. And it is the abundance of resources that we need to speak to and to celebrate as each one of you so beautifully exemplifies, not just those who have spoken today, but those who have gathered around in this room. It is the abundance of spiritual, practical, material, religious, secular coming together to celebrate that which is important in life, which is not just to prevent harm, but to be able to celebrate the joy that comes with the grace of belief and faith. And on these words, I wish to uh, continue to learn from each of you, to thank you for your wisdom. And I hand the floor now to Ms. Bani Dougal, our host, and a member, a very active member of Religions for Peace's council. Religions for Peace includes all of you. Thank you so much. Bani, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, dear Aza. And I think I am going to be echoing everyone's sentiments in this room and online when I thank 
you for your leadership, for your steadfastness to the cause of bringing faith leaders and actors together to work in collaboration on some of these really critical uh, areas. You've been doing this ever since I met you, which has been a long time, and I don't want to age you or myself, <laughs> but uh, it is a commitment that comes from the very core of who you are. And I thank you for that. And I thank you and I wish you all the best in all the future endeavors that you're going to be involved in. And I do hope we are all going to be there with you along the journey. So thank you, Diaza, and thank you to all the uh, hosts of this program for having put it together. I know a lot of work went in. I was seeing all those emails from Siam to Deepika to Allison to everyone on the team at Religions for Peace and the various organizers. And thank you, Your Excellency, for gracing us with your presence. And I think at the end of these programs, uh, events, I'm always left wanting for more because it, just as it's getting, really, we're getting to the meat of it. It seems like time, time is over, but I look forward to the conversations as they continue. And uh, lots of love to everyone. Thank you.